Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today's Monday, July 1st, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Well, friends, we didn't have an episode last Friday. My apologies to everyone who tuned in. But no worries, we're not skipping anything in Luke. Today, my guest has agreed that we will cover what we missed, and we're going to open up chapter 4, verses 1 through 30. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, is led into the wilderness, where he fasts for 40 days and is tempted by the devil. He resists each temptation using the word of God. Afterward, Jesus returns to Galilee and begins his ministry, teaching in the synagogues. In Nazareth, his hometown, he reads the words from Isaiah in the synagogue and proclaiming the fulfillment of the prophecy in himself. Well, people marvel initially, but then their admiration turns to anger when he speaks of God's grace extending to the Gentiles. They drive him out of town, intending to throw him off a cliff. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning as we explore the Bible verse by verse, uncovering the profound truths and promises of our Lord. Whether you're tuning in online over the air through the KFU app or through your favorite podcasting service, I'm delighted to have you with us. Thy Strong Word is made possible in part by our good folks, the sponsor at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. They translate, publish, and distribute biblical and faith-enriching resources for people around the world. So go see them online. Visit them to see how they can help you with your outreach ministry. That web address is lhfmissions, with an S on the end, dot org. And your opinions are valuable to me. Whether you have questions, comments, concerns, qualms, complaints, or compliments, I want to hear from you. You can reach out to me by email at pastorboo at gmail.com or connect with me on Facebook. That, on Facebook, you can just search for Phil Boo and send me a message or a friend request because your thoughts and feedback are always welcome. Well, let's get to it. Joining us this morning, it's the Reverend Matthew Lorfeld. He's the pastor of St. John Lutheran Church in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Good morning, Pastor Lorfeld, and welcome back to the show. Good morning, Pastor Boo. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on, and uh, today some exciting texts to go through. Um, We're going to start with... uh, uh, you know, Jesus being whisked off by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. Uh, Such an interesting text, as always. Luke's treatment of it is a little brief, but it's definitely something worth diving into. And then, uh, and then, well, on to uh, some of the troubles that he's already getting into as he preaches. But before we do any of that, would you go ahead and start us off with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right in. Certainly. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we ask that you be with us as we look to your word. Um, Help us to always see your Son, Jesus Christ, in it, who has come to be our righteousness and our salvation. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, last Friday... uh, Due to uh, my own complete fault, <laughs> nobody else's, uh, we didn't have a show. So I, I was going to have Pastor Tice on. I've already sent him an apology. Um, but you have agreed to help us walk through Jesus' temptation out in the desert. So I'm so grateful to you. So I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 14, the whole account from verse 4. And, uh, and then we'll start talking about it. Here we go. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, 
Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Um, and let's actually let's just stop there. So we'll stop at verse 13. So here we go. We have uh, uh, Jesus out in the desert. Um, take us through this. But, but what stands out to me, and I, I think it probably, I, you know, I was well an adult before I realized this part, that it wasn't the devil who took Jesus out to the desert. It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit whisked him out there. Um, kind, kind of interesting. We don't, we don't think about that. Yeah, indeed, it is the Holy Spirit that um, that um, leads Jesus uh, into the wilderness. Um, in, in other gospel accounts, um, it, it's almost like the, the, the picture is almost of, of Jesus being pushed, uh, uh, driven into the wilderness. This is a little bit more gentle, um, but nonetheless, um, yeah, going into the wilderness uh, is not. Um, not the uh, uh, most uh, pleasant of experiences, and it recalls, of course, the 40 days of wandering in the wilderness. But yes, it indeed, it is the Spirit who is doing so um, to, uh, to, to be, so that he may be tempted by the devil. Yeah. I mean, we think of a lot of places where God is meeting with, with folks out in the desert. You know, in Exodus 3, the burning bush, of course. Mount Sinai is out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and as you pointed out, you know, the the, the wandering, uh, the testing of the Israelites on their journey to the promised land. We can find that in Deuteronomy um, and Exodus, of course. But but yeah, so he's out there in this place. Um, and I think where we really see that key is that he's out there for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And when we think about the temptations of Jesus out in the wilderness, I think we we often, at least I do, I guess I can speak for myself, what comes to my mind are these three big ones that are elucidated here. But as Luke describes it, these were three that came after 40 days of tempting. So it's interesting, we don't really get a lot of information anywhere else about what was going on during those 40 days, or what kind of temptations there were. Yeah, correct. We 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 do not. We just get these these final three, and uh, Scripture tells us that Jesus has been tempted in every way in which we have, and yet he did not sin. So um, there certainly is, is more temptation that Jesus faces than these three, uh, but these are 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 uh, kind of the pinnacle um, of the temptation, and they really. They stand in, 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 in many respects, um, to, to point out that Jesus is uh, the, the fulfillment of, of what Israel failed to be, and also the fulfillment of what Adam failed to be. Right. And, and, and so we also see the devil coming on the scene here, though. I don't know. I mean, the, the Greek word here, diabolos, devil, you know, it's a very, also a, 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 a Middle Ages term. I think it was one of the preferred ones, devil and devils instead of demons. Um, it's rendering the Hebrew word Satan. Uh, tell us a little bit about, I guess, and, and this sounds kind of simplistic, but who is the devil? Who, who the devil is? What role is he playing? He seems pretty powerful in this account. Well, he's a liar. Uh, that, that's what the word diabolos <laughs> literally means, a slanderer. Um, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. It, I just, it, I love that, though. This guy's a liar. I just want you to know that to get to go. No, I, I love it, though. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. The liar. Because yes, he does. He lies uh, in this. He lies in this case, in this, in this scene, too. But go ahead. Yes, he's a liar, a slanderer. Um, and uh, Satan, uh, the, the, which, which isn't... Um, the, the name Satan isn't used in, in this gospel. It's used in Mark. Um, I, and I don't want to keep going back to other, but it, it does bear uh, uh, just uh, pointing out that that means to be the adversary or the accuser. Um, the, you know, the, the, the devil, um, you know, is, is one of the fallen angels. Um, so he's a created being. He's not like the evil equivalent to God. He's a, 
a created being that rebelled against God um, and took with him, um, according to Scripture, a third of uh, the host of heaven. And uh, you know, these are the, the the devils or the the demons um, that that uh, oppress and, um, in some cases, possess. Well, let's talk a little bit about his his lies, his scheming, his accusations. The devil says to him in verse 3, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong or if there's a better way to understand it, but I've always believed that the devil knows good and well who Jesus is. So why this if-you-are language? Well, he's a one-trick pony, <laughs> really. It, at all, all the devil's temptations can be boiled down to uh, he wants, uh, in this case, Jesus, or, or in other cases, us, uh, to, to not believe what God's Word has already said. Um, and, and this has been the way from the very beginning. Uh, did God really say? And of course, when he asks Eve this, uh, he twists God's Word and, and changes it. Uh, but in this case, he doesn't. But um, uh, he, uh, he, he wants to tempt Jesus to doubt uh, that that Jesus indeed is who the Father said he was just in the previous chapter. In chapter 3, the Father said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And if you go back um, uh, also to the genealogy, the genealogy in Luke goes from Jesus to Adam, and Adam is the, the Son of God. So this is, this is once again a, a question of, are you indeed the Son of God, as God has said? You know, are you going to believe what the Father has said? And and to distrust this uh, would be to forsake uh, his own sonship. Um, and that's the aim of the whole temptation. Um, and so Jesus is going to face uh, the the devil in his temptation uh, by by saying, no, this is what God has said. This is what the Word has said by saying it is written. What might you say to someone who says, well, Jesus was tempted, but not really, because he was God, and and therefore it was really easy for him to overcome these temptations. Um, that, that's not the Christian way to understand it. What, what, what advice, I guess, would we tell someone who's kind of thinking, ah, this was a piece of cake for Jesus to resist? Well, he, he is fully God and fully man. Um, and so, according to his humanity, he is going to um, suffer things like hunger and, and need to be fed. This is why he says man does not live by bread alone. He doesn't say man does not live by bread at all. <laughs> um, he needs to eat. Um, and one can indeed fast for 40 days. Uh, it is not uh, a very easy task. I, I myself love food and Fasting for me is always a, um, a an extraordinary challenge, um, and uh, my flesh is weak. And, and uh, Jesus here in his fasting for 40 days is, is telling his flesh, you're not the boss of me. Uh, but it, it was, a, it was a, a, a difficult task, just as it would be for any of us, because he indeed is fully man. He requires food. Yeah. Jesus really was tempted and really did overcome them, and that's good news for us. Uh, Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. That's from Deuteronomy 8.3. It's worth reading the rest of that. Um, again, I tend to believe that Jesus probably, the discourse was a lot longer. This is just sort of uh, pointing us toward it. So that's why I want to read 8.3 from Deuteronomy. Um, it says here, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. So you're right. He's not saying that, hey, man doesn't need any bread. Of course he does. But what's greater than that is abiding by the word of God. And that's certainly what he's going to do here. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, everything I've read says that's, that we don't really know what that means. <laughs> do, do you happen to know what that means or maybe have some guesses on what's going on? Is Because it, it seems like a if the devil's able to do this, 
it seems like a pretty powerful ability. So I, I'm not sure if you've even given it thought. I, not not a lot, but you know, this is one of the the realities that you know is is. God is not himself bound to time in, in the way that we are in this very linear fashion. Um, you know, this is something that um, that may have been part of the temptation to show all the, the kingdoms of the world. And one of the things that's really interesting, if you look back into the Old Testament, um, the, the, the tie between uh, the, the devil and the, you know, the, the fallen angels, the demons, um, and their their authority and power, or their assumed power and authority, is is that of these worldly kingdoms. Um, in the mm. book of Daniel, uh, Gabriel is delayed. Uh, it's it, it, so that was delayed because I was uh, you know fighting uh, the 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 power um, of Babylon. You know the you know in other words the demon that's you know kind of sitting behind mm. the throne of Nebuchadnezzar. So. Um, you know, it is. I, I the way I read this is that it is the the, the kingdoms of the world, you know, in, throughout the world and throughout all time. So um, he's showing them everything, you know, all the worldly power and authority, um, and, and the temptation here is to give give Jesus their authority and their glory, um, and, and that that's a very significant thing. Um, again, this is. Uh, I, I, I failed to mention with the first temptation that there is a tie into the garden. Uh, of course, the, the first sin was that of eating, eating that which they were told they were not to eat of Adam and Eve. Um, and the second, uh, the second part of this then is also tied to their sin of wanting the very glory and authority of God. Uh, wanting to be like God, knowing good and evil, and Jesus, uh, Jesus is tempted with this, uh, this same temptation to, to have an authority that, uh, that the devil says that he can give him, but his claims for authority are always, um, they they always end up to be empty promises, yeah, and empty claims. Very, very hollow and suspect, you know, but you're right. I yeah. can hear both in the first one, the eating and the temptation there. And in the second one, you know, do you want this? Do you want this authority? You know, do you want the same glory that God has? Um, then then eat of this the, that you've been commanded not to eat. And, and to Jesus, he says, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. That's very God-like language which is where I think the deception is coming in. So to look out and say, look, I, I am the, the power of the spirit that's working the air, which we know is not a good thing. Um, I mean, he's he's the, 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 the prince of darkness ruling over a fallen world. Um, in a way, God has given that to him or at least let him reign in it. But he doesn't really have the authority to give it to whom he will. At least I don't believe that. Yeah, it, well, it is it is a it is an authority and a glory that is doomed, um, as Isaiah right. forty uh, says, uh, that this that this authority uh, ultimately is, is going to come to an end. You know, the the authorities that that the uh, that the kingdoms of this world wield, uh, and and their their authority of the wielding the sword, even it is all because of the fall. Uh, it is all. Uh, simply to to put evil, um, you know, to curb evil, uh, but ultimately on the last day, this this authority that that the devil is hanging in front of Jesus that will be, it'll be nothing. And of course, Jesus refutes him with the word of God. He goes to Deuteronomy six thirteen. It is written, "You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve." But then it says he took Jesus to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down because God's not going to let anything bad happen to you. Um, of course, the devil quotes scripture here. It's almost like he's getting he's getting the shtick. He tempts Jesus. Jesus defends it with scripture. He tempts Jesus. He defends it with scripture. And so then you, you called him a one trick pony. He really is. 
he then uses scripture, but in such a way that is not honest. Yes, indeed. He, uh, uh, he once again, um, now, uh, imitates, you know, and this is, this is part of, of the, of the devil's way of, of operating too. He, he doesn't even have, he doesn't even have the originality to, to do anything that is of his own. And so he always gives a cheap imitation and part of the cheap imitation is to cast out, but it's also to, to twist and to maim and, and to use the word of God, um, contrary to its meaning. Um, and, uh, and once again, Jesus does respond, uh, with, with scripture. Uh, one thing to point out, um, just as in the last two, uh, where Jesus quotes, uh, this is this is from the wandering in the wilderness period, where where Jesus where Jesus quotes and and speaks back uh, the word of God uh, to him, um, and and so uh, the the Psalms that he quotes, um, I believe he uh, quotes from Psalm ninety one, um, and uh, um, but but Jesus. Uh, Jesus uh, simply does not even give the devil the time of day here. One thing that the Bible quotes, be... I was going to say, the Bible quotes Psalm 91. Jesus goes right back to yeah. Deuteronomy, right back to the lessons that Israel was supposed to be learning in the wilderness. And so, yeah, it connects yeah. us to the fact that Jesus is doing perfectly what Israel, when it wasn't reduced to one man, couldn't and what we can't. Yes, indeed. And and I wanted to, you know, there's a couple of things to point out too back in verse nine. Um, that that in going to the in going to Jerusalem, they they, they go to the temple itself. And and this is the high place of Jerusalem. Whenever you say I'm going um going to Jerusalem, you say I'm going up to Jerusalem, and then when you go away from Jerusalem, you go down from, even if your elevation may be opposite of what you're saying, uh, because for for uh for the Jews during that time, uh, Jerusalem, the temple itself was the highest place because that was the, the very place where God dwelt. And, uh, and, and that's also then, uh, part of the scandal here, uh, that, that, uh, that the devil is taking Jesus to the very dwelling place of God as if, as if that was, you know, his to, to show, um, and then to tempt Jesus, by throwing his his own body, uh, throw yourself down from there, um, because surely the angels will will catch you. Right, right. So go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. See, basically, put God to the test, and of course, Jesus refutes that. <sighs> now, savvy readers might notice that it is a little different order than Matthew. Matthew kind of does a chronological order. Luke puts them in a different order. I think. Um, I think our guest has made it clear, kind of perhaps why Luke is doing that. I don't know that we know for sure, but it definitely matches up a lot to what we see, well, with the garden and with the people of Israel. And it's such a reminder that that Jesus was truly tempted and genuinely overcome those temptations, but he did so with the word of God. And we're given that same gift to overcome the temptations today. Because how many people out there, both who claim the name of Christ and some who don't, want to use the word of God against us, either to condemn us by misusing it or trying to shame us into doing something wrong by manipulating God's word, um, by taking it out of context, by twisting it. Um, and how often do we, and we have to be very careful about this, uh, you know, misuse the, wor the word of the Lord. Sometimes even unintentionally we'll take little scriptures out of context and and think suddenly they mean everything about us as opposed to what they really mean. So it really does emphasize the importance of being in the Word of God. If dear listeners, you know, if you're in, if you're listening to this show, I know you're a, a person that is in the Word, but um be more in the Word. Make sure your friends are in the Word. This is our weapon against the temptations of this world. Uh wouldn't you agree, brother? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The uh uh, God word, God's word is um, not only our great heritage, but it is that mighty fortress um, which protects and surrounds us. Uh, because the word is not just some words; it is it is God's word, and uh, God is, in fact, uh, especially when we speak of God the Son, He is the Word made flesh. 
Right. So when you're in the Word, you're literally <laughs> with the Word, the Word of God, um, Jesus Christ Himself. So, and, I, and I'll tell you too, and this is just to uplift all the brother pastors out there. Um, Lutheran pastors, especially in the LCMS, are, are very uniquely equipped to be able to teach and preach the Word of God. Um, I, I've been, a, you know, I grew up in a, a lot of different church bodies. You guys have heard me talk about that. And I'm not trying to dismiss anyone, but I can tell you that um, the emphasis on pastoral formation in the Word in our Lutheran confessions um, is, or confession rather, is just an absolute gift. And uh, so make your, avail yourselves of your pastor, folks. Um, I just want to <laughs> kind of give a plug to the local parish pastor. He really is a great resource for you. Folks, we're right here at the uh, breaking point. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break and hear the messages from these good folks. But don't go anywhere. When we come back, Pastor Lorfeld and I will keep on going and we'll pick up with what happens to Jesus when he gets out of the wilderness and starts teaching in the synagogues. Don't miss it. We'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today, it's the Reverend Matthew Lorfeld, pastor of St. John Lutheran Church in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Friends, don't forget, you can reach out to me at pastorboo at gmail.com or on Facebook with your questions, comments, and feedback. And if you're able to give me your question or comment while the show's still going on the air and I can fit it in, I'll do my best to do so so you can get your questions answered on the air. And even after the fact, I can forward your questions to our guests, and they're always happy to uh, field those after-show questions. So uh, let's get right back to our text. Okay, so we're we're done with that. And I, I just want to uh, thank my guests for kind of on the fly, a very knowledgeable uh, pastor, so I didn't expect that he'd have any troubles. But, yeah, he, he helped us catch up. Now we're to the part where he was supposed to talk about today. We're going to start with, uh, well, I'm going to read verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All right, I want, I want to stop right there. So, so the, the synagogue worship system, style, methods are, are so foreign to us Christians today. So it might be a good idea to kind of describe to people what's going on, like, like, what's with the attendant and the scroll, and then why is Jesus even allowed to talk? I mean, that does that have, so, brother, elucidate us a little bit. What's going on in this synagogue worship? Well, um, this is this is a um, 
a little bit uh, of a of a mystery even for us still today because we we have detailed accounts of what goes on in the synagogue after the destruction of Jerusalem and after Christianity, um, you know, that, ha- that occurs in 70 AD. Um, so our, our more detailed uh, accounts of, of what goes on in the synagogue uh, kind of come after the post-temple period. What's going on during Jesus' time um, is, is a little bit of a carryover from their time when they were in their Babylonian captivity. Uh, again, the 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 being separated from the temple necessitated something. You know, the, the center of the, the worship of the people of Israel was to be first the tabernacle, then the temple. Um, and, and that's where, if you go through and read Leviticus, all the all the worship that, that God gives uh, his people uh, is, is, is centered right in there. But when they're cut off from the temple, then they begin... In essence, a service of a of the word, um, and, and this really actually has carried over uh, somewhat into our own liturgies uh, in our in our in our Christian church, where we have uh, the reading of, of God's word, uh, maybe maybe the singing of God's word as well. Um, sometimes uh, there might be. Um, more than one person that that is doing reading, and there might be then, uh, and there is to usually be uh, then the exposition of scripture. Um, Jesus is doing nothing really new here. He's doing what the prophets did. The prophets essentially would preach on uh, on on what had come before. So Moses is kind of the very first of the prophets. He r- writes the first five books of the Bible. The prophets that follow him. Their preaching uh, always kind of goes back to uh, to that first one, as as Jesus was quoting in in his temptation, the the book of Deuteronomy. Now he'll be quoting Isaiah because that was the reading for the day, and so he he is is given a a an honored uh, position, being the son of of his. Uh, of the town, uh, being from Nazareth and being a recognized teacher, uh, he is he has gone from synagogue to synagogue, but now he arrives in in Nazareth, and his the reception there is a little bit different. Yeah, uh, just a couple of more details too. You know, obviously we see it going on, but the custom at the time was to stand to read the scripture and then sit down to teach, unlike a sermon today, for instance, where we would go behind a pulpit. You know, Jesus sits down, and so when it says all the eyes are on him after he reads it, well, that's because they're waiting for him to do the teaching part, right? They're waiting for the exposition. Yeah. Um, and so he reads this, and you talk about it being the assigned reading, right? So, yeah, he he unrolls the scroll. He finds the place where it's written. Um, it, it's a little dubious if this was the passage he was supposed to read or if it was a continuation or if just they gave him Isaiah and he just found this. But um, any of those things, it doesn't really matter because Jesus brings people's attention to this particular uh, scripture. And and he says, I think what no one expected, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And it, it would be like, you talked about a son of the town, I love that. It'd be like maybe a son of the congregation, he's gone off and he's now a pastor uh, or perhaps he's, you know, uh, training to be a pastor. And so he wants to come and, and preach in your congregation. Uh, and so he comes and he preaches. But then he, when he ends, he says, and I am the Messiah returned. You know, people would run him out on a rail, <laughs> throw him off a cliff. Well, that's that's really what's happening on the ground. Jesus is saying something extremely um, controversial, uh, to say the absolute least. He says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, at this point, they don't quite know, I think, 100% what he's trying to say, but we are going to keep reading, starting with verse 22. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, 
Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you that there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. That's the end of verse 28. That's where I'm going to pause. So what's upsetting the people? What's upsetting them with what he's saying? Oh, well, um, first he speaks uh, with, with, with an authority that they haven't heard before. Um, and he speaks well. They marvel at his the words that are coming from their mouth, but they, they do say, isn't this Joseph's son? You know, certainly um, it, it's quite the possibility that there were some in that synagogue that day that had remembered Jesus as a child. Maybe even, you know, uh, I remember when you were in diapers kind of thing. Um, right. and, and that is, it, 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 uh, it, 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 it's, it's a difficult conclusion to come to when when you're you're trying to wrestle with the humanity of the Messiah and 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 for for some they can't get past that is this not Joseph's son and of course the the, the biblical answer here is well not really uh, Joseph was Jesus's garden garden guardian uh, but uh, but of course Jesus was uh, born of of Mary who retained her virginity um, so. Uh, I like that. I just, uh, by the way, I like that though. It's like, is this not Joseph's son? You're absolutely right. The answer is no, it's not. (laughs) I'll be honest. I I hadn't really occurred to me. I mean, obviously it makes perfect sense, but you know, he he, he also, I just want to say, he also said a lot more words than what are recorded. Right. So he's, he's talking about all these things because so far he hasn't had a lot of gracious words recorded. So he's saying he's teaching, he's bringing this all up and you're right. Some people are starting to say, Hey, and then this is Joe's boy, and and and, but you're right. The answer is not really. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, and Jesus says, you know, that that all that they had heard from Isaiah has been fulfilled. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me. We, we hear again that the spirit not only brought him out into the wilderness, but attended him as he went through Galilee, and so the spirit never left. And of course, this of course this is a very trinitarian first line. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. So we have a, a, a spirit, Father and Son um, there. Uh, he says that uh, that what he has now come to do is to proclaim good news, uh, proclaim liberty to captives, uh, recover sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These sound like great things. Let's have that happen here. I. I got a blind friend. I I, I need to hear good news. Um, so okay, Jesus, do that. <laughs> but Jesus says I'm not going to. And yeah, that I mean, is where they that's where they well, he, start uh, to get upset. Yeah, I just wanted to interject too because he knows their heart, obviously, because he says, "Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb: physician, physician, heal yourself." Or I always want to say, "Thyself, heal thyself." Um, you know. But when you look into the Greek, that reflexive yourself could also refer to your own. So some commentators have suggested, and I think rightly, that the proverb that Jesus is referring to is basically, physician, heal those who are your own. Do something good for us. What we heard you do at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. That kind of, it, it makes it, li- it's not like, Jesus, you need to fix yourself. It's, Jesus, you do all these great things. Well, now, you know, give give your friends, give your family, give your own town some of that. And you're right. He says, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. I think as pastors, on the very first level reading of that, it's so true. I mean, it's true just in the sense that it's always hard to overcome your reputation growing up. Why it's It's kind of difficult for, say, a young man to grow up in a congregation and go back to that same congregation and be a pastor at uh, not not that it, it's impossible, but I think it adds some challenges. But perhaps what Jesus is saying here is maybe a little deeper than just, you know, it's hard to uh, to go home again. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, even even in our own kind of our own experience, although we don't have the same kind of prophetic office that Christ has, we have something similar. Um, the church didn't see any reason to uh, avoid having pastors uh, being raised up in their own congregations and sure. uh, being put in there. But uh, but yes, I, I I do see the difficulty. It would be it would be hard because I know that. You know the the reaction that I spoke of earlier. You know, I I can go to my home congregation and know people that babysat me when I was a, a very young child, and so it, there is that challenge. But um, but there's also um, a, a an unwillingness uh, to to hear the word of God uh, due to the familiarity of the speaker, and I think this is this is a little bit more of the danger here is that. That the those in the hometown of Nazareth um, simply uh, are are refusing to hear the word of God that Jesus speaks, and he references then Elijah from First Kings and the miracle uh, with the women at, at Zarephath. Yeah, and I always like to bring that in. Let's go ahead and read just a little bit from First Kings seventeen, where we get that story. Uh, then the word of Yahweh came to him, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose, and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there, gathering sticks. And he called to her, and he said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hands. And as she said, as, God, as Yahweh your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may. And he continues, of course, that she's going to make that and basically die. Um, and, and the Lord provides for her. But he's saying there were lots of widows, lots of people who needed that help. And and God didn't come and save them all. And in and, and, I think we see this same complaint today when it's like, well, why does Jesus heal some and not others? Why does God give grace and mercy to some uh, for their for their worldly needs and not others? Um, I, Jesus, if I'm not mistaken here, is basically trying to explain to them that he's not a traveling sideshow. <laughs> he's there on a mission. And, and even those yeah. he heals now are going to die. Um, and, yeah, you know, there's a greater purpose for his visit than just to go around and do miracles to satisfy their curiosity. Yeah, he's not an amusement for your birthday parties or anything like right. that. Um, he has come uh, to to be uh, a prophet, uh, uh, to speak that prophetic word. And the miracles that, that he does are, are intended then to accompany and verify that what he is saying is true. Um, they have had the word made flesh amongst them, um, but uh, often they wouldn't hear it. And and this is the this is the burden that uh, that that Nazareth now bears. It's very similar to Elijah and Elisha, who are uh, largely rejected uh, in their in their home uh, towns and home countries. Elijah goes so far as, you know, running away uh, all the way down to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and saying to God, I'm the only believer left. And God says, no, there's 7,000 still that haven't bent the knee to Baal. Um, but uh, but Elijah certainly felt uh, that, that same kind of rejection as well. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, this idea that the prophet Isaiah is proclaiming the this this Messiah is going to come. Jesus says that he is the fulfillment of that. Um, but the people he mentions too, the widow of Zarephath and um, the uh, a Naaman, um, they were both Gentiles. So do you see Indeed, there's yeah. a connection? Yeah, do you see that there's a connection there between God's mercy being extended to the Gentiles and the provocation of these folks' anger at him? I mean, it's not just that he's not going to do for his own, but then he quotes situations where God literally didn't do for his own, but provided help to to uh, people who were outside the covenant. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the the repeating theme that you see that those who are, uh, you know, on the inside, those who have the easy access to God's word, 
uh, don't hear it. And yet it, it is heard then by those that are outside, like the widow of Zarephath, like Naaman. Um, and, and we're going to see this through Luke's writings, especially as he, he goes on to write the book of Acts. You have, uh, that's the, the, the theme of of the book of Acts, how uh, the word that was rejected by so many in in uh, in Judah in in Judea uh, is now received by the Gentiles. You know, the Ethiopian eunuch, although he evidently was a Jewish convert of some sort uh, that was reading it. But you you see this over and over, where where the people that didn't have the word when they re- when they have it receive it with joy and and it bears much fruit so jesus says you're probably going to quote to me oh physician heal your own and then he gives a couple examples of where god healed people who weren't necessarily his own i mean they are in the grand scheme of things but then in verse 28 they become upset and now we're going to finish up i'm going to read the last couple of verses starting with 28 when they heard these things all in the synagogue were filled with wrath And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Now, first of all, this really does give definition to that escalated quickly (laughs) because he goes from them saying, hey, this kid's got it together. Joseph's boy knows what he's talking about, to they're literally trying to throw him off a cliff. Um, I don't know that you know this, but it just, were they, were people in the habit of throwing people off of cliffs back then? I mean, that just seems like such a, a wild thing in our more, uh, sort of in our society, you, that would be attempted murder. (laughs) Well, Jesus here, if, if what he says is not in fact the case, if, if he is who he is claiming to be, and he is making it very clear that he is claiming to be the Messiah. Uh, if he in fact is not, uh, it's utter blasphemy. Um, and and they know that that's that's what the what he deserves. I mean, um, while I, I wouldn't recommend or or condone any kind of violence, even towards a false preacher, um, if there is such a false preacher in 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 a in a congregation, he should be driven out. Um, maybe sure. not. Uh, not off a cliff, but uh, certainly not not permitted to continue his false teaching. But that that's what the that's the response of the people there. They 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 will not tolerate what what they are seeing as false teaching. But of course, they're wrong, um, and they're wrong, uh, and they're proven wrong by the very fact that that they they can't they can't put a hand on him. It's not Jesus' time yet. It's not his time to uh, to. He is the one that's going to lay down his life. Um, and that will be his glory uh, when when he chooses to do that. Um, but it is not his time yet. And so, uh, though uh, many of us can maybe relate, having people upset at something we preach, this is this is uh, <laughs> even even a greater. I've I've never had, by the way, I've never had anyone even threaten violence. I've had people mad at me because of something I've preached. I've had people walk right. out on me, but never, um, <laughs> never. <laughs> Never I had a, throw me uh, off a throw at me an off LWML place. convention. I was speaking at once. I had an, uh, a seasoned elderly lady on the front row turn off her hearing aid on purpose so she wouldn't have to hear me. So <laughs> we've all ex- <laughs> oh. we, we've oh, all no. experienced it. Um, you know, it, but that's it, right? If you're going to suffer, suffer for righteousness' sake, and and that's what he's doing. This, it, you're right. If he was not true, if he wasn't, if he wasn't who he says he was, then this would be. Um, now, I don't know if this was lawful, but he would have been open to a lawful stoning discipline according to God's law even in that community. But they're running him out on a rail, which frankly is kind of a good thing to do if the man is a false prophet. But it cautions us in a couple different directions as we look to imitate Christ. At one, we shouldn't get up there and claim things that aren't in God's word. Um, certainly, you know, not uh, not claiming to be Messiah, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, as listeners, we must put ourselves under the authority of God's word, not his word under our opinions. And typically that's what's happened. There have been cases where I haven't been clear and have had to apologize. Um, but then there have been plenty of cases where 
I was perfectly clear and consistent with scripture and it was their own convictions that upset them. And that's the balance and that's the that's the that's the cross that pastors must bear. But Jesus here um he Luke really understates it. He passes through their midst. That's how he gets away. He passes through their midst. Uh, but I think this is unquestionably a miracle though because this is a whole synagogue of people running up a cliff. I mean, just the passing through, I don't think, was just dumb chance. He miraculously moves uh, out of their their war path because, as you've already said, it wasn't his time. Yeah, and uh, and and in the midst of it, their their reaction here. I wanted to highlight just because I still that we're getting close on time that they that they want a different kind of Messiah. Uh, yeah. He's not the Messiah that they that they want. Um, he's not the the Christ, the Jesus that that they want him to be, and and we see this so much. Uh, you know, we we might want a Jesus that 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 stands up for our own agenda, whatever it may be, whether it's political or 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 uh, whether it's you know for human justice or whatever the case may be. When we try to co opt Jesus as ministry into our own purposes it, it never ends well um and and this is this is the thing about jesus he's not he's not going to be who we want him to be um unless we we put aside all our our wants and desires and 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 simply let him be that that wild jesus that that has come to be our good and uh and a gracious uh savior amen to that well, um, that is going to be pretty, getting pretty close to the end of our time. Just a few minutes left, maybe like 60, 90 seconds. Anything else you want to you wanna share about this passage or anything else you want the folks to know? Uh, well, I would just say keep what's going on in mind because the, the, the story doesn't end here. Uh, the people are rejecting. They, they don't want Jesus to be uh, the kind of Messiah that he says he is. Uh, the kind that that doesn't give them the signs and so forth. Um, the very next thing that they're going to run into, that you're going to be running into in this gospel, is, is a demon. And I'm going to let the next host um, uh, bear uh, bear out that text. But but it is it is a stark contrast uh, how the demons will receive Jesus mm -hmm. in comparison to the people. Yeah, and you bring up an excellent point, too, and that is that Jesus's messiahship, him being the messiah, is not subject to the opinions of the people on whether or not he's the kind they want. Um, it's not like calling a pastor even where you you want a guy that you want as opposed to the guy you don't want. Even that shouldn't really be that way. Uh, but it, And it's not like just sort of choosing even a church. Well, I want to go here but not here because of X, Y, and Z reason. Christ is the messiah. If it doesn't match up with what they think, then that is irrelevant to his mission. Um, but you're right. His own people reject him, but even the demons know the truth. And, uh, yeah, that's convicting in and of itself. Well, I'd like to thank my guest this morning. He's been the Reverend Matthew Lorfeld. He's the pastor of St. John Lutheran Church in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Excellent pastor. Uh, thank you so much, brother, for being on the show. Oh, it is always a pleasure. Hey, folks, come back tomorrow as Pastor Chris Mathis comes on. He's going to move us into that exorcism of Jesus and a miraculous healing and him calling the first couple of disciples as we finish up chapter 4 and move on into chapter 5. So don't miss that. But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.